My name is Gene Rowe. I'm the founder of LIDAR News. The title of my presentation today is Towards Standardizing HD Maps for Autonomous Vehicles. For those who don't know me, I'm a civil engineer with 50 plus years of surveying and mapping experience. And I have to admit it, I'm an early adopter of high technology. I have been for my whole career, uh, both in the hardware and software industries. Currently, I'm the chair of the ASTM E57 3D Imaging Committee. Some 15 years ago, we began work on the data interoperability standard known as E57. My reason for mentioning this is to encourage everyone that a standard can be developed. It does take a significant amount of work. I think we were in the six to seven years before we were completely done, but there were very similar circumstances today in this autonomous vehicle world to what it was like back 15 years ago with all of the scanner vendors using a proprietary data format. So let's take a look at some of the types of maps in use today for driving. Uh, the first one will label navigation maps. Um, I'm sure everyone is aware of these. This is what you have on your smartphone and your in-car navigation systems. Uh, they're certainly adequate for displaying a route, uh, kind of a visualization approach and the turns needed to go from point A to point B. But they certainly don't have the level of detail needed to ultimately support uh, autonomous vehicle navigation. Next uh, up the ladder in terms of sophistication, accuracy, detail would be the maps that are uh, being used today in what are called advanced driver assist systems and also connected vehicles. Um, there's really no uh, assumption or no one is saying that these maps have the level of detail required to support autonomous, fully autonomous driving and vehicles. They maybe could be called smart maps in that the vehicles uh, in a connected vehicle environment all must have a connection to the internet, which allows them to communicate with not only other vehicles, but also traffic control devices and ultimately a traffic control center, where in real time, the people operating that center can make adjustments to the network, uh, delay times and things like that to reduce congestion across the city. Which brings us up to HD maps, our third level. Uh, just as in the case with photography and video, uh, and unlike, however, defined formats like TIFF or JPEG, there is no standard definition accepted by the industry for an HD map. They're certainly not going to go to the expense of having them be survey grade, but at the very minimum, all fixed objects within the right-of-way are going to need to be accurately located uh, to have it become an HD map. Uh, Wikipedia has put out a definition. You can see it here. They're a highly accurate map used in autonomous driving, containing details not normally on a traditional map, uh, precise to the centimeter level, and often captured using an array of sensors. I don't know about radar. I don't think that really applies to an HD map, but, and this is providing meter by meter information uh, about the road and the car driving system, current and oncoming. So why do we need uh, HD maps? The way these autonomous vehicles are going to work is they're going to compare in real time using the sensors on the vehicle, what they're seeing compared to what the 
database, the HD map database says is out there. Um, that's the real reason for having these maps as the baseline, if you will, for uh, autonomous vehicle navigation. Um, this is the, uh, the base maps are obviously not affected by weather. They have a tremendously longer distance or range to them. Uh, they're digital, so they can be relatively easily updated with new information that could be coming in uh, all the time in an autonomous vehicle network. So uh, there's a need for them. There's no doubt about that. Uh, as mentioned a little earlier, uh, the data sources, aerial LIDAR, photogrammetry, photographs, uh, van-based mobile LIDAR. And then there's the whole crowdsourcing uh, world uh, and street view type data, Google Maps, et cetera. And one that uh, we don't think is being used or tapped, but could be very easily are a number of the national geospatial databases such as 3DEP and uh, the national map programs. So what's the market uh, look like for HD maps? Um, the projections are that we're in, uh, at this point around one and a half billion in market dollars per year expense or spend, uh, spend uh, and that in less than 10 years, 2030, we're gonna be up to spending 17, nearly $17 billion a year uh, on creating, maintaining, developing uh, high definition maps. So the VC money is certainly driving this industry uh, along with the automobile manufacturers. There's well over 70, if not approaching 100 autonomous LIDAR, autonomous vehicle LIDAR companies, startups out there today. And with nearly 37,000 people dying last year in the United States alone, and I believe it's over a million worldwide, there's certainly the opportunity uh, for uh, an improvement in the safety of automobile transportation. In fact, I think if we were starting from scratch, today with the car, uh, you'd already see autonomous vehicles on the road because they're going to reduce that number, but uh, there's still gonna be fatalities and accidents. And therefore I think it's going to take major social change to uh, actually support the elimination of a driver and a steering wheel and brakes and all of these other things that you see in some of these concept cars. Uh, and that doesn't uh, address the issue of privacy and other legal issues that are going to be out there. So, as I mentioned, HD maps today, uh, there's no industry standard for their specification in North America, at least. It's really the Wild West. Uh, there are some de facto standards for photography and for video, high definition versions of those. There's not even anything like that in the map world, to my knowledge. Uh, unfortunately, transportation agencies are not involved in the development today of high definition maps, uh, which leads to just incredible duplication and waste of effort. Uh, NVIDIA announced last uh, week, they're gonna map 500,000 kilometers worldwide. They're coming into the HD map business uh, with full force. A company uh, that's done this work for General Motors, Cadillac especially, uh, called Usher, claims to have done all of the interstate uh, highways in both the US and Canada, over 150,000 miles. Once again, who knows what the formats are, what the specifications are, it's all proprietary, it's all secret. So some of the concerns, uh, why is each uh, autonomous vehicle company building their own HD maps? 
uh, they claim it's liability that uh, they have to be the ones to develop their own maps so that uh, they're not gonna rely on some other company to, uh, when an accident occurs, to accept that liability. So this just leads to incredible waste of energy, uh, high costs that are going to be built into the cost of an autonomous vehicle and their driving systems. Uh, there is an organization, we'll talk a little bit more about it on the next slide, in, based in Germany that's trying to do some positive things about this. And uh, certainly once these maps are available, there's going to be issues with safety, with big data, with keeping them current, with security, with privacy, and that's just a partial list. The Navigation Data Standards Association, or NDS, they're based in Germany. One of their key benefits that they provide to their members is legal protection. Uh, that if you're a member uh, and you use any other member's uh, IP, uh, you are protected from uh, being sued uh, by any of those members. Uh, the NDS specification is quite comprehensive, it appears. It specifies the data model, the storage formats, the interfaces, the protocols. These are all steps certainly in the right direction. Um, I'm in contact with those people and uh, we'll see if there's some way to hopefully work together with them. Uh, their members are car manufacturers, application compiler developers, map and service providers. And as I said, the big benefit is protection from litigation. So standards in general and the business case for standards. Uh, standards create value and opportunity for the people that work on them. I've seen it uh, in many cases with the E57 uh, in data interoperability standard. Uh, this working on and developing and supporting standards can create competitive advantage for your business. Uh, there's certainly the opportunity to reduce the environmental impact of the data collection and processing that is, is gonna take place if 50 or 100 companies uh, go out and it's already happening. I mean, I, I'm sure the number of interstate miles that have been surveyed and resurveyed uh, in certain areas uh, is tremendous. Uh, and this is not something that uh, anyone should look down upon, but the developers of standards can influence the creation of those standards. And you also obtain advance notice of pending standards. So what uh, Qasem Abdullah, who has been uh, involved, he and I have been working on this slide deck, what we recommend is there should really only be one central database for HD maps for each country. Uh, transportation agencies should have a leading role in this development process. A HD industry working group needs to be created to develop the standards. And I don't think it will be that difficult a project, actually. Uh, this could include AASHTO, FHWA, and perhaps the German organization NDS. Then the map should be managed by one organization and be certified compliant. Uh, possibly with what's called HPMS, the Federal Highways Highway Performance Monitoring System, which is already in place. And partially, in fact, maybe 75% of the way there in terms of specifying what should be in that HD map. So in the US, the US DOT, <coughs> excuse me, FHWA, ASHDO should take the leading role in the specification and development uh, and coordination of HD maps. So I wanna thank you for taking the time to uh, attend 
this session. Uh, both Kasim and myself are available for your comments and um, for your interest potentially in supporting this. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them. Hey, Gene. Hello, John. You changed your shirt. <laughs> yeah, this is the real Gene. <laughs> <laughs> Great presentation. Uh, I, uh, I learned a lot about the, uh, the importance of the HD maps. Um, you're, uh, you're doing quite a lot of work on that. Congratulations, and thank you for doing that. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah, it's it's a volunteer effort at this point, but we'll see if we can get some real uh, force behind it to uh, do the work that's needed. But like I say, when you really look at the highway right away, there probably aren't more than 20 common objects in the whole right away. This, this is not rocket science. This is not some huge mapping of the entire country or world like some of these organizations are proposing be done. This is a pretty narrowly defined set of objects that need to be, be located. It's doable. It's doable. <laughs> okay, we've got uh, quite a few questions here in the Q&A, so I'm going to dive right into it. Okay. Uh, here's the first one is, when do you think there will be a fully autonomous fully autonomous vehicles on the highways, no steering wheels or brakes. <laughs> it does. It makes me laugh because I cannot picture myself ever getting into one of those vehicles. I don't care what it would do or what it would have. But if this thing is not going to be a total bust, it's got to happen this decade. It's got to happen by 2030 that uh, we start seeing these. It might be in lower speed environments, cities, maybe where it's 30 or 40 miles an hour on city streets, 70, 80 miles an hour on the interstate. I, I still have some major questions about that. I just don't know. I don't know. <laughs> okay, next question. Should state uh, DOTs require data collectors to be licensed? Uh, I have a pretty big bias with regards to the whole issue of the um, ownership, if you will, of the uh, publicly uh, funded um, highway system that doesn't even talk about trains and other forms of mass transit and things like that. But uh, Google and others, uh, have uh, just taken it upon themselves to go out and map all of the uh, highways, the public highways, and then charge people to use them. So I'd like to see that model changed a bit. I'd like to see the DOTs enforce their ownership of those yep. assets and therefore yep. license people who want to make commercial use of that information, of that database for whatever reason. So that's that's my uh, way out there idea, <laughs> but uh, that's the way I feel about it. So there's, uh, I think a connecting question here. Who owns transportation network data? I guess this would depend on the jurisdictions. Yeah, true. But of the state highway systems, I think the states, I think the state government, or the province, the provincial government uh, owns that infrastructure. They certainly built it. They certainly repair it. <laughs> they do everything else to it, except, well, I wouldn't say that they don't say they own it, but they just let anybody do anything they want with the information that is uh, that it's built on. Uh, I'm gonna skip down to a question here from Corrigan. Uh, do HD maps collect, capture, and accurately identify roadway surface defects, roughness, cracking, potholes, et cetera? If yes, I envision opportunities for their use beyond autonomous vehicles. As far as I know, no, at this stage, that that level of detail is, is one step beyond what the HD maps, what the autonomous vehicle people care about. So uh, I, I don't see that. I don't see really uh, 
a quarter of an inch accuracy or a couple millimeter. Ac I don't think that's either. It, it, the Wik Wikipedia said, excuse me, said uh, centimeter. And I think that's more realistic. Okay. Uh, another question here. What about having autonomous vehicles connected to N-trip casters or with Starlink Blue Origin creating Wi-Fi anywhere on Earth? Would maps still be needed? I don't know what N-trip casters are. Do you, Yeah, Joe? I don't know either. No. Um, yeah, but I, know what that I think the second part of the question is clear um, about, well, I guess if the, everything's connected through Starlink or um, some other... You can be connected through satellite Wi-Fi. Um, I guess they're saying- I can see that being very valuable, being very important, helpful to the real time updates of the maps. But I don't see it replacing this comparison. I don't think, uh, who knows how fast it could be eventually 20 years from now. So. And you'd need to be able to run a vehicle without being connected to the internet for right. safety reasons, I would think. Like you can't uh, rely on that for right. everything. Right. Uh, and as well, I would think about, you can't remove the brakes or the steering wheel. <laughs> I think someone's always gonna have to be able to take control, I would think. Um, another uh, question here, should the AV industry be protected from liability? You know, I, I actually think there's a thread of an idea there. As I mentioned in the, uh, pr in the uh, recording, if we were starting from scratch with the first automobiles and we could, people knew that having autonomous was going to reduce the uh, accident levels and the fatalities and things like that uh, by X percent. Let's take 25% maybe, or, or a little bit higher. I think they'd be on the road right now. But the fact that you get even one fatality off of any autonomous vehicle, like they did in Phoenix three or four years ago with, I think it was Uber, uh, that shut down the whole thing. They shut down their whole testing operation in, uh, in the state, and that was that for one fatality. Same thing's happening with Tesla, with their autonomous vehicle, what they call their autonomous vehicle, or uh, what do they call that? I forget. But anyway, somebody went uh, underneath a tractor trailer uh, with it on, not paying any attention. I think maybe even asleep. Uh, and uh, that was that. There's a, uh, every year in Ottawa, uh, I used to go in person pre-COVID. There's an autonomous vehicle uh, conference for Canada, and there's a, a big test track for autonomous vehicles in mm. Ottawa. They love testing stuff here because of our weather. The, mm -hmm. the road conditions are so rough. Um, I What I saw was liability was hugely important because there was a bunch of law firms <laughs> exhibiting <laughs> um booths talking about so anyone who, who's involved in the supply chain of where is this vehicle and it's driving who's liable how much how much is our company liable we did this part of the system uh i think that's what the the um the law firms were were there really to to speak towards, and I've seen them um, sponsoring autonomous vehicle events here. That, wow. that whole area of liability is incredibly important. It's incredibly <laughs> important. And I think to get this thing off the ground, that there's probably going to need something like that once it really, if they, uh, this no brakes, no steering wheel is what they call level five. That's the highest level of autonomy in this system that they have of zero through five. <clears throat> to get to that level, I, I really think you're gonna, the government is gonna have to stimulate the, the, the that business model or something to get people right. to, really put the, the money into it. But I mean, you know, you look at the General Motor, you look at any major car manufacturer worldwide, 
they are all hard at building their autonomous vehicles. They are seriously building these autonomous vehicles. They expect that is going to happen. Uh, um, the liability is going to be crazy. There's, uh, I've been watching the chat. There's some comments in the chat. There's one here from Ahmed. He mentions Mercedes will accept liability when the autonomous drive pilot is engaged. So wow. the, I guess that's how they're handling it, is they're saying we're going to take on that responsibility. Thank you very much for that. Um, is there anything you wanted to close out with on this talk, Gene? Oh, boy. No, I think I've said probably said enough, John, depending on who's in the audience. <laughs> they might be sending me some nasty emails after this. <laughs> but uh, uh, we, we appreciate your, uh, your insights and your perspective on this and the work that you're doing on it. Uh, standards are incredibly important. Yeah. I myself am on uh, the ISO standards uh, group here for Canada for um, some geospatial subjects. Yeah, so yeah, that, it's always good to support the community, support our sector that way. Yeah, that would be the final statement I would make is please, if you're interested, let me know about working. And once, just like in terms of the number of objects, uh, the 20 odd objects or so, this doesn't take an army of people to do this. We, we did E57 with basically six or seven people that wanted to, really make it happen and it, that had the ability you know that took would, would invest the time in working on it you you have to work on it you can't just have a call every month for an hour and think you're doing something that's not gonna get it done but it's not going to take a hundred people it would be uh counterproductive to have any more than 10 people on the committee okay well with that we are uh into our final break mm -hmm.